Today, we're diving into a key piece of analysis that every business needs to do, a trade receivables aging analysis. Whether you're managing a small business or working into corporate finance, managing overdue invoices can make or break your cash flow. I'll walk you through how the code thing works and then we'll take a look at a practical example in Excel. Let's get started. Accounts receivable aging analysis. There are a few benefits that we can get out of performing this analysis uh, regularly. One is that it allows uh, management to reevaluate our payment terms. So the credit terms that we're providing to our customers, we can see if uh, they're constantly lagging. Maybe the industry is used to a different uh, set of terms. So we can adjust that. And uh, even by switching from, let's say, 30 days to 60 days, if that's the industry norm, it's going to delay our collection initially. But once we start operating like that, we'll be able to better predict our cash flows to better estimate uh, our cash flows which is going to be much uh, better for the business. We can also use our uh, aging analysis to automatically or semi-automatically block sales to customers that have a large outstanding balance. So we can have this like a regular check and we can notify those customers that uh, no further services will be rendered until they clear their uh, outstanding balances. The aging analysis helps us essentially maintain a healthy cash flow uh, for the business and uh, helps us identify potential risks of uh, bad credit. So that's uh, what we're going to uh, touch on, the doubtful debt allowance provision, which uh, can be calculated via uh, data obtained from an aging analysis. And uh, this helps us be better prepared for the future and for uh, when some of our customers inevitably uh, default on their payments. Something important that uh, can be tracked alongside performing the aging analysis is our average collection period. It's uh, equal to our uh, day, day sales outstanding minus our credit days, the, the terms that we provide. So you see here the formula for uh, day sales outstanding at the average receivable. So opening balance plus closing balance divided by two. That's your average receivables for a period. Then you have the credit sales for this period and multiply that by the days in the period. So this would show us how long on average it takes for our uh, receivables to be turned back into cash. And if we subtract the credit days, the terms that we provide on average, we'll get our average collection period. So it's a good idea to calculate that regularly and track it over time as it can be really helpful alongside the uh, aging analysis. Here in Excel, uh, I have a list of open invoices from uh, different companies, the invoice ID, the amount and the date of the invoice. And uh, those are in 2023 and 2024. And let's say we're doing this on, let's say January 5th, 2025 and uh, we want to know how uh, delayed our receivables are. So we don't have the maturity date here, the date uh, where our customers are supposed to pay. So we can add that and uh, we're going to say that we have 30 days on average as a credit term. So we can have our uh, maturity date and the maturity date is going to be my uh, invoice date plus this 30 days fixed with F4. So essentially, it's going to add 30 days on top of the uh, day. That way we get essentially our due date when the invoice was supposed to be paid. The next thing we want to calculate is our overdue days. So how many days is this invoice overdue? We said that we're doing this on the 5th of January 2025. So essentially for overdue days, we'll have this uh, here, fixed with the F4 minus the maturity date. And uh, we also need to format this as a number and we don't need any of those. If this number is uh, positive, this means that there's a delay. So for example, this was supposed to be paid at the end of 2024 and it's been delayed by five days. But if it's a negative number, then it means that this date has not yet come. So the invoice is uh, not overdue yet. Next, we'll calculate our aging group. And uh, this is uh, where we're going to write a bit of a more complex formula. 
We're going to use the lookup function, which essentially has uh, three uh, things that uh, we will pass. So we have the lookup value, which is going to be the number of overview days. And then we'll have two vectors, a lookup vector and a result vector. So what we'll do with the lookup vector is provide bounds. And the result vector would be what the result should be when this lookup value falls between two of the bounds that we are providing. Okay, comma, so we're providing vectors in uh, curly brackets. And the first range will be from negative 999 to one, because this, is, uh, this one will be included in the next range. So essentially we wanna do it till zero, but uh, that's why we have one. Then we're gonna do one to 30, so we'll have 31. 30 to 60, so we'll have 61, 60 to 90, so we'll have 91, 90 to 180, and 180 to 365, which is gonna be 366, so for one year, and uh, then we'll have more than one year, so we're gonna have 9999. This is our lookup vector, so essentially it's taking this value and seeing where it fits between those, and now we have to provide the result vector and it's gonna have one element less. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight elements. Our result vector would have seven because the first one will fall here between this negative 9,999 and one. The second one will fall between one and 31 and so on and so forth. Comma, open another curly bracket for our result vector. And uh, here we're gonna say zero point, I like to number those so it's easier to uh, arrange them later on to sort them. So this is gonna be not overdue. Then we'll have category one, which is gonna be zero 30 days. Then we'll have category two, which is gonna be 31 60 days. We'll have number three, which is gonna be 61 90 days. Category four will be 91, 180 days. Then we'll have category five, which is gonna be 181 to 365 days. And our category number six will be above one year. Close the curly bracket, close the bracket of the formula and hit enter. As we said, this formula essentially takes this value, sees where it fits between those and assigns the corresponding result. And this is what we use to separate uh, our uh, receivables into an aging group. I'm gonna select the whole thing and insert a pivot table. Here we can have our company code, our company name, then we'll have the amount and the uh, values and we'll have our aging group as uh, a column. Let's uh, fix how this looks. I'll go to design. I don't wanna see any subtotals and I wanna show it in a tabular format so that the company code is next to the company name. And you see here that essentially we got those uh, spread out into the categories per customer. So we can easily perform our analysis. I'm gonna grab this whole thing and uh, put it on a new spreadsheet here. I can spread those and I can select all those, format them as a number, and uh, I can start calculating some totals. So sum, I'm gonna select this whole thing all the way to the end, and this would give me how much is in this category. Let's copy that to the side, and uh, this is our total. I wanna calculate what percentage those are out of the total, make it a percentage. And uh, we see that we have more than 1% of our receivables has been delayed for more than a year. And we can immediately see this company here is where this is coming from. And this company is actually uh, quite problematic because even though they owe us so much from uh, past periods, we're still working with them and still delivering. So we're still making sales that have a high potential of not being uh, settled by the customer. So if we're performing this analysis for uh, a company, we'll probably highlight that and we'll definitely see about uh, limiting our exposure to them 
which might include like putting them uh, negotiating a payment plan, uh, lim- decreasing the amount of business we do with them or stopping it altogether. Then if we go down, we see that uh, this here is quite overdue, this here as well, but at least we're no longer hemorrhaging money into uh, those uh, customers. So this is the, the biggest issue is uh, this customer, Dickens Bratke. And you see how this really quick analysis outlined something that uh, we might know internally that we have a lot to collect from them, but it's much easier to analyze when we can look at it in one place and uh, just see that uh, there's actually an issue here. Once we have this and uh, we're doing this essentially at the end of the year, what we might want to do is uh, do our uh, doubtful debt allowance provision. And uh, usually what we do is uh, we have some uh, sort of percentages that might come from a historical experience on, let's say, if something was delayed more than 90 days. There was uh, like 50% of those were never collected, things like that. So there are different ways to define this percentage, but essentially it's, uh, it's all about professional judgment. So we can say that we'll definitely have uh, like 0% provision for uh, our uh, not overdue. And let me do those calculations. This multiplied by this total. Copy that to the side. And here we'll have DDA provision, which is going to be the sum of those. Now let's go ahead and assign percentages. So above one year, probably won't get anything out of that above uh, half a year probably looking at around 50 percent again those percentages are really like up to you essentially uh, here we can go 25 percent and maybe 10 percent here so by doing that we now have our doubtful debt allowance provision which we can record on our balance sheet and uh, we can essentially recognize an expense for this because we're expecting with this certainty that uh, we might have to write off some of those balances so we are expensing them in uh, 2024 and uh, recognizing this provision if we collect them we're gonna we'll be able to close them against the provision and if we uh, write them off we'll write them off against the provision so that uh, we're not incurring expenses in future periods. Thanks for sticking around till the end. I really hope you enjoyed the video. And uh, if you want to dive deeper into financial modeling, I've created an entire five-hour financial modeling course that's available completely for free right here on YouTube. And uh, you can check it out in this playlist up here. Thanks for watching and uh, I'll catch you in the first video.